Now, Bill, so, you're especially nasty to our last guest, so you got to be on better behavior for our next I, one. I'll be much. I'll be nice to you, Jason or Senator, because uh, Rob accused me of not being nice to uh, uh, to the boss. Bill was feisty yeah. in that last segment there. JB, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. Well, I'm I'm glad that Hornby and I switched our nine to nine thirty slots. This. <laughs> I think Bill got all that anger out of his system. No, I was just venting. I was watching Rob this morning vent, so I just kind of followed the suit. Well, it's, all right. it's maybe easy. it's Corey's turn now. <laughs> no, I stay be. calm. Stay calm. <laughs> Uh, before we, uh, I, I don't know if, if, I think he has it ready now. Okay, great. So if you could, Colin, go ahead and bring across that um, graphic that Mr. Hormby was talking about with DHHR. Jason, I know you haven't seen this yet, so I'm not going to ask you to comment on it. Uh, but I just wanted, since we had that in our last segment, I wanted to get that on our TV screen before we began talking to Jason about uh, some other things, too. But there is the flow that Delegate Mike Hornby was talking about for DHHR in terms of the way they're thinking about breaking this down and going around an office of shared administration kind of in the middle as a hub. Yeah, if I could comment very quickly. The key to this, though, are the solid versus the broken lines. Uh, between the uh, Department of Health and Care Service, what has March number three, that's a broken line. Everything going to Office of Shared Administration is a broken line, as opposed to a solid line. Broken lines, I believe, at least where I've seen them in the past, means coordination, but not um, not part of the chain of command so i uh, this to me raises more questions right, we can get into that we uh next chance we get yeah. you. in the meantime let's talk to delegate jason or senator jason barrett formerly delegate jason barrett here who's uh, waiting patiently via the telephone here jb let's talk about uh, first and foremost tax cuts and the uh senate plan which is uh in the house right now we had ken apple on yesterday local cpa and he took a look at the way the senate law is written the bill and said that as far as he can tell, it doesn't correctly address the marriage penalty, which is one of the items that I know the Senate was trying to address in that. Now, it's one of many items in there, but he doesn't feel like it's been addressed properly in terms of how you want it to come out. Has anybody brought that to your attention yet? Uh, actually, a member of the House called me last night uh, that I think Ken had reached out to to discuss that. So. Uh, Ken, if you're listening, send me an email so I can take a look at that and we can verify for sure um, if that piece is right uh, in our bill. And if it's not, we'll make it right. That would be that's a good plan. I, I know Ken said the last time when uh, they dealt with uh, trying to uh, make sure that seniors weren't paying taxes on Social Security, they put in so many exemptions that he said it affected almost nobody. And by the time he got a hold of the delegation afterward, it was too late. The bill had already passed. But the people that it allegedly was going to help was actually quite uh, limited. See, this is also a reason why I told you it, in the very first week when everybody was chomping at the bit to get a tax bill passed immediately and right away, these are the type of things and the reasons why um, you use up a lot of the session to properly vet this, not only through members of the legislature, but uh, qualified and um, uh, professionals uh, out in our communities that look at these things and that, that work on these things every day. So that's why it's important to make sure that you uh, do it correctly and not do it quickly. Agreed. 100% on that one. Then let's talk about the Senate bill. What reaction are you folks aware of in the House in regards to the $600 million bill you sent over? We just talked to Mike, uh, Delegate Hornby, and he said it didn't seem to be accepted that well in the House. Well, I'm you know, I, I have a, a really busy schedule here in the Senate, so I, I see House members from time to time. I don't get to see them, um, you know, obviously as much as I used to or really as much as I'd like to. But, um, you know, I do communicate with the Eastern Manhandle uh, delegation uh, over in the House uh, frequently. We meet on Monday evenings at 5 o'clock. Um, I think that, that, you know, I would expect them to take our plan up um, and, and pass it without making changes and, or coming to the table with some type of, uh, changes or negotiations, and I, I think we're in that process. So. Billy? Yeah. Uh, we also talked to Steve Roberts this morning, and he was uh, very uh, supportive of the Senate bill, and uh, mm -hmm. and I also get the impression the governor, at least according to Steve Roberts, uh, the governor's looking at it uh, uh, somewhat favorable eyes as well. Uh, well, I think that if you look at the – I'm sorry, Bill, I interrupted yeah, you, but no if problem. you look at the governor's comments right after the Senate press conference last Wednesday, he was – 
complimentary of the plan and said that, um, and I'm paraphrasing, that he liked uh, several of the components of the plan. So um, I, I think that was, was optimistic for him to, um, you know, speak uh, favorably of the plan, and, and hopefully we can get to a place where, where we can come to a consensus. Do you into and I, as you said, you have not talked to the House on to a uh, great degree of depth, but do you anticipate there's certain stumbling blocks that you're going to have to work around before you can get an agreement with the House? Well, <clears throat> my opinion is that we should figure out the dollar amount, come to an agreement on the dollar amount that we can afford. That is that gives tax relief to the people of West Virginia, but also doesn't put us um, in uh, financial problems in the out years of, of our budget, knowing that our severance collections uh, are at an all time high uh, and, and you can't base, um, you know, the large tax cuts with the assumption that those revenue collections from severance are going to stay at the levels they are right now. So I, to answer your question, I think that we should figure a dollar amount that, that's affordable um, and, and provides meaningful tax relief to the people of West Virginia, and then look at the ways in which we, we do that. And that's, that's my understanding of what was done by Senator Tarr and the fi- Senate Finance Committee. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I think that, that that's where you should start. You shouldn't say, well, I want to get rid of this tax, this tax, this tax, and this tax, and then figure out how much it costs and figure out how to pay for it. I think that you do it the other way. I think you figure out what you can afford and then uh, what gives uh, the, the most meaningful tax relief to the people of West Virginia using that dollar amount that, that we've agreed to, that we can afford. Corey. Jason, I'm gonna um, we're gonna stay on taxes here, but it's gonna be a little bit um, of a different angle. Um, so I see SB 483, um, and it says relating to taxation of gambling and lottery winnings. Um, I was w- I was hoping if you could give me a, a brief rundown on that. I, I can. That bill is actually it's also a House bill um, that I think is getting a little more traction at the moment than that particular Senate bill. Uh, so what a lot of folks don't understand is that um, if you uh, make gambling, legal gambling wagers in West Virginia. And, and let's, uh, I'll use a, a, a slot machine as an example. So if you put $2,000 in a slot machine at a local uh, private club in the Eastern Panhandle, and you lose $2,000, and you get to your very last spin, and that spin hits for $1,200, mm-hmm. you will pay tax on $1,200, even though you lost 800 yeah. Um, there are there are a lot of sports gamblers around that wager uh, a fair amount of money, uh, and they may win a lot one week and lose a lot the next week. Um, but if they ever hit above that twelve hundred dollar threshold, they're going to pay tax on that, and their their losses are not factored in. What happens? And the federal government, you're allowed to. Uh, your, your federal taxes, you're allowed to deduct your losses against your winnings, and that's what this bill would do. Uh, what what happens is because the folks that gamble uh, large amounts of money uh, in, in this, uh, they can't deduct their losses, it pushes them to offshore and to illegal platforms um, that is obviously not taxed at all. The state of West Virginia would receive no money um, that, that the platform would pay uh, – based on the 10% sports betting uh, tax rate or the 15% uh, iGaming tax rate. No, so that, I, that's the reason for the bill. Thank you. I mean, that's when I you know, was looking through you know, the different bills that you um, have been the lead sponsor for. That one obviously uh, caught my eye, considering... Yeah, you know, and that's not one I'm working very hard. Uh, I think the folks in the House are working that one. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of delegates over there that, that are also well aware of the issue. Um, it, it's really just a tax fairness uh, thing, and I, I introduced it on here in the Senate so that we could have a vehicle, uh, which is what we refer to a bill that, that you know that we can that we make sure that we have uh, one on each side, uh, just in case one of them got bottled up. Thanks, Jason. I think that's fair. Yep. How, how's the progress of certificate of need legislation coming along in this session, Jason? We were led to believe there would be something passed about CON for this session before it ends. Well, I don't, I've introduced uh, several CON bills. Um, I have one more going downstairs that that um, really just kind of changes definitions about where imaging services can be offered. 
And um, it's not a CON repeal. It's not uh, really the direction that um, I would prefer to go. Uh, but uh, you know, you have to um, you have to introduce legislation, and, and a lot of times you have to take what you can get. And um, I think a CON repeal uh, is pretty difficult in this legislature at the moment. Uh, but I do think it's incredibly important um, that we open up imaging services um, to other medical facilities, uh, especially in our area where um, there that you wait a long, there's a long waiting period uh, to get necessary imaging services. The cost of the imaging services are three and four times uh, in our area what they are in, um, you know, in, in, than they are in facilities just 25 minutes from uh, from Berkeley or Jefferson County. So, um, you know, this is about patient access uh, and affordable health care. And, and so I've taken a little bit different approach with this particular bill that um, uh, just went down to bill drafting late last night uh, to change again to change the definition of who is able to offer imaging services. Can you explain why, with such supermajorities of Republicans, eighty-eight to twelve in the House, thirty-one to three in the Senate, why is it so difficult to get a CON bill through that addresses the uh, repeal of CON that so many Republicans talked about for so long? Well, I think you've heard so many Republicans in our area talk about CON for a long time. I mean, this this CON to some degree, we have a lot of doctors, uh, not a lot of doctors, we have a handful of doctors in the legislature, and many of them don't support um, CON repeal. They view they view it as trying to put free market principles to a system that is not a free market system, because there are health services offered uh, that are financial losers and some that are financial winners. And so what they argue is that when a, uh, you want the hospital to offer all services, not just services they make money on. So what they're trying to protect are hospitals from that, that offer all services, uh, and, and imaging is one of them that is made that there's no secret that imaging uh, is somewhat profitable. Uh, and so that what they're concerned about is when other healthcare facilities only start to offer services like imaging or things that make money, and they offer that at a cheaper rate, then the hospital is stuck with uh, not having the clientele or the payers of those services. They, they're then stuck with the services that don't make money, and that creates a problem for the hospital. And this is a lot, similar to a locality pay issue in that it's not really a Republican versus Democrat. It's more of a a regional issue, and there are certainly the folks in, in Raleigh County with Raleigh General, they're not supportive of CON repeal. A lot of the rest of the state, uh, in my view, are afraid of WVU coming in and offering competition uh, to their local, regional, rural hospitals. And in the Eastern Panhandle, we're trying to give WVU competition. And so that's, that's really what the fundamental difference comes down to. Part of the complaints about the escalating cost of health care, however, is that you make it more of a free enterprise system. And if you if you have CON, it's not free enterprise, the complaint goes, and therefore the cost of health care remains higher, artificially higher. Well, I would completely agree with that. And I think that you look at the cost of medical care over the past number of years, um, I don't know that we have anything to lose. I mean, I don't, I don't know how, and I cautiously say this, I don't know how medical costs could go up any, at, at any higher rate than what they have. And yet they will. Uh, with, sure, and, and I'm... Um, I, I mean, from, from repealing CON. And, you know, for me, it's about access. You know, we have a highly populated area, growing area in our, our area of the state. Um, I want to make sure that, that, that people have access to quality health care and, and as affordable, and I, I almost hate to use that term when talking about health care costs, but, but as affordable as it, as it reasonably can be. Jason, let me shift gears with you to another Senate bill uh, that's been proposed. That's Senate Bill S uh, 602, 602, which would allow a couple of the uh, four-year schools to offer an associate degree, uh, Bluefield State and West Virginia State. Uh, the community college is, are adamantly opposed to this. The community college presidents have been very vocal in the opposition. Do you know anything about that bill and where it's going? I don't because it's such a high number. It had to be introduced with just in the past couple of days, so I haven't I haven't seen that. That would obviously go to the Senate Education Committee. Um, I, I would tend to agree with the CTCs. Uh, it's my understanding that the only four-year institution currently in West Virginia that offers associate programs or two-year programs is Fairmont State. Um, 
I don't particular. I, I think that that we should have a separation between our CTCs offering two-year programs and our uh, four-year institutions offering four-year programs. That, that's where I come down on that. If there's a specific reason why state or, or Bluefield need to offer uh, those programs, um, then, then I, I, would, I would at least listen to that. But um, my default response is and, and, and stance is that the CTCs should have, uh, they're, they're the ones that have the, should have the sole ability to offer two-year programs. That will make the CTCs very happy. Thanks, Jason. Corey Roman. Yeah, staying on the topic um, of education here. Sorry, it just seemed to uh, completely. Did you lose your sound? Yeah. I did. did you kick out your headphones? Hold on. Well, well tell you, go ahead and ask your question. Jason will answer. I'll turn your mic back off, then you can. Senator, hear um, yesterday we we heard on the uh, program from Delegate uh, Don Forst um, the idea of electing uh, superintendents for our schools. What are your What's your opinion on that? Electing county superintendents, yeah, or for, for the schools, the state. yeah, for the schools. Um, I, I'd have to hear an argument as to why that's the path we would go down. I mean, we're, we're talking about. I, I, my first question would be: Are there going to be qualifications that are required of this position? And and very few positions in West Virginia on the ballot actually have professional requirements. Uh, you, typically, it, it is something in the judicial field uh, where you'd have to have a law degree. Uh, also, the Ag Commissioner, I think you have to be a farmer. But aside from that, and, and even um, uh, magistrates don't have to have a law degree or, or, or have uh, specific educational requirements or professional requirements. So I would be extremely cautious moving forward uh, with uh, making the superintendent elected position. Uh, I, I think that certainly our school board should be elected. That superintendent should always be accountable uh, to that county school board, uh, and that, that that school board is, is accountable to to the voters. Uh, but I think a superintendent, you know, the, the, we need to do national searches, especially in our area, when we look at superintendents, just so that we've said we've done our due diligence. We have done um, what is what is appropriate to find the absolute best candidate. Very possible the best candidate is in our own backyard, but but I think that we owe it to the students. Uh, and teachers of our uh, education system to ensure that we have the best person for the job, not necessarily a politician. Or, or we're putting someone who is, I, I, I get concerned about people in the education field that are not politicians, that we're going to turn them into one. Uh, I, I really get concerned about the number of folks that are qualified, would do an excellent job, want the job, but don't want to run for office. And, and so I, I, I would have to hear a hell of an argument to support that. Yeah, I think if we're going to elect superintendents, we should elect teachers too. Each classroom, oh, each classroom yeah. have an election for a teacher. <clears throat> yeah. What do you think well, on miniature? Think of the ad revenue that'll generate for this radio station, Bill. <laughs> I'm running for fourth grade art teacher. <laughs> yeah, and this is my platform. I smile a lot. I vent a lot. I'm, I'm good. And no CRT. <laughs> no CRT. No Jason, CRT. Jason, I've got about 45 seconds left. Last word is yours. Thanks. Hey, the locality pay bill, Senate Bill 593, that we've talked about the past couple of weeks, uh, passed unanimously out of the Senate Government Organization Committee. Uh, it now goes to the Senate Finance Committee. Um, there's no fiscal note on it because it's, it just requires these agencies to implement, to develop uh, and implement a plan in the future. Uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get this bill out of the Senate, and hopefully my friends over in the House uh, will be able to garner enough support uh, for locality pay. Hey, thanks, Jason. I'll talk to you again next Wednesday. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jason. Have a good one. Senator Jason Barrett.